Hello all, this is Bob Browner with Community Coronavirus Update number 114. Today we'll talk about shots for kids under 5, which is the, probably the biggest news in the last week. Uh, the, the three doses of vaccine is the best route to endemic and uh, some challenges as far as trusted sources in the future. Uh, so the biggest news last week, and uh, this is a good summary from Caitlin Jetalina about the science behind it, but the FDA and CDC have recommended vaccines for kids under five because the benefits strongly outweigh the risks, and the decisions were unanimous, so that should hopefully give people some more comfort. Uh, why is this important? Well, uh, although COVID is less risky to kids than it is in adults, it still is risky though, and there are a lot of uh, deaths, there were over a thousand deaths to children due to COVID in the past two two and a half years. Uh, and so it's still worth uh, vaccinating for because this is a lot of unnecessary deaths. What you look at the lower rate, that's the, the, the last decade's worth of uh, influenza deaths over similar time frames. And so influenza also is another another large source of vaccine preventable deaths in children. We have vac highly effective vaccines for both now. We need to vaccinate against both because there's a lot of preventable deaths in kids. Uh, unfortunately, school shootings made the headlines with the, with the shootings in Texas. As tragic as that is, a lot more kids die of influenza and COVID than die from school shootings. And so people need to put these things into perspective. From a numbers perspective, COVID vaccinating, vaccination is the most important thing to worry about actually, followed by influenza. School shootings certainly do a lot to prevent and we, we're doing quite a bit in Lincoln Public Schools to, to, to increase the safety of your kids. But don't forget that COVID vac has now become the most common vaccine preventable source of deaths in children. And so Dr. Kate Legendalina put this on uh, her slide update last week. Uh, so a lot of vaccine uh, preventable deaths uh, are, are gone now. So we rarely see deaths from varicella, rubella, rotavirus, things like that anymore. Influenza, we could make lower if we got our vaccination rates higher. Now COVID-19 as well. And so these are avoidable deaths. They didn't have to happen. Um, also looking at hospitalizations, it's not just a death, but you don't want your kid in the hospital either. And here are age ranges of hospitalizations, and you'll see that in the older age groups, COVID was much more serious than influenza, but comparable to influenza in terms of hospitalization rates in younger age ranges. But we have vaccines for both of these this, this year, the, right now, and we need to continue to, to vaccinate well uh, for kids in the future for both diseases. Um, keep in mind the other thing that's concerning to everybody is be this vaccine hesitancy from COVID is spilling over to others and so last year we had a lower rate of flu vaccination in kids uh, we were used to be up in the uh, up in the high 50s and 60s, but unfortunately it's dropping a little bit. And so we need to remind parents influenza is still something that kills children. We need to vaccinate against both. Uh, and re remember that even the past years, people have forgotten there are times where we've had to close schools for a week or two at a time because of things like influenza, occasionally even RSV in the past for younger kids. Uh, so these are both things we have to keep about thinking about in the future. And the good thing is we may be able to prevent both of these with vaccinations and potential occasion intermittent masking if necessary in the future. Uh, again, uh, kind of another article that came out in New England Journal last week is showing that unfortunately that the, the hesitancy goes uh, in, in groups. And so what this study is showing uh, that people who had the highest uh, vaccine uptake for COVID also had the highest vaccine uptake for influenza. And the opposite tr was true uh, for, for people who had the highest hesitancy for COVID also had the had declining rates of influenza vaccinations. And so we need to work on, on, on this understanding of how, how vaccines work more in the future. Uh, again, these are preventable deaths. And as I like to point out, you know, there was a time uh, over a century ago, and I like to use the example of my great-great-grandfather Herman Rehnquist uh, out in Chapel, Nebraska. Uh, he had uh, three, lost three of his siblings, two to diphtheria, one to typhoid. Uh, diphtheria is a vaccine-preventable disease you hardly hear about anymore because we vaccinate all kids usually at least six times by the time they finished high school. So I'm not sure what people are so worried about the fact that they have to have more than two shots for COVID. Uh, keep in mind that many of our vac vaccine series have a primary series of three shots. Look at how many of these have one, two, and three, one, two, and three, several with boosters afterwards. And so just like uh, diphtheria, tetanus, and pertussis, uh, COVID is a three-shot uh, vaccination with potential boosters afterwards. So this is the th sixth diphtheria that you typically get by high school. Uh, what I think is the future is that we're going to have uh, uh, annual vaccinations for both COVID and flu in the fall is the most likely scenario that we're going to end up with in the future. Hopefully the vaccines will be given together as a combination for the same reason we put we bundled tetanus, uh, diphtheria, and pertussis as the, in the same shot. So hopefully that's what we'll see in the future. Uh, the other thing that I think we need to keep fighting against is people have this misconception that somehow a natural immunity gives you uh, uh, stronger and more lasting immunity, and that's actually not true. So in this uh, study of uh, people who had uh, 
uh, a BA1 infection, did it prevent them against subsequent infections? And this uh, overall the world shows that infection during the BA1 wave did not appear to offer protection against the newly emerged sub sublineages. So you may be hearing a lot about people getting a mild dose of COVID yet again, even though they had COVID six months ago. And so what we're finding is that, that uh, natural, uh, quote, natural immunity by itself is not uh, that protective long term. Uh, what we're finding though is the combination is actually the best so it just even though you may have had a, a, a mild uh, infection in the past you still want to get your three vaccine series so for example in this case people who had uh, prior uh, omicron infection were only about 46 percent of protected against the next inf uh, infection from a symptomatic infection people with three shots 52.2 percent the people with two shots and a prior infection, 55%, but the effectiveness of a previous infection in three doses was 77.3%. So even if you've had a quote natural infection, you still want to complete your three shot vaccination series. That'll give you the best protection in the future to prevent you from getting sick in the, in, in the future. Uh, keep in mind that uh, that a lot of the people during this Delta wave, uh, we had this uh, hospitalization rate. These are the people who had no vaccinations. Many of these people actually had been infection previously from either the Wuhan or, or Alpha strains when Delta came through. The best protection was two or three shots, and three shots was by far the best even uh, eight months ago. Uh, also keep in mind, so this is actually the Bryan Hospital, but still is putting out its uh, visuals. Uh, this is from last week and this is today's visual. Uh, all the people in the hospital la for the last two weeks, for the most part, have been people either A, have not been vaccinated at all or only had two shots. And last week there were even three kids in the hospital who were unvaccinated. And so again, we need to make sure you're vaccinating everybody and three shot is, is the most protective. Now you'll occasionally see some people with three shots on this list, but those are typically people who are immunocompromised for some other reason. Either they're on chemotherapy, they've had a bone marrow transplant, they're on other uh, immunosuppressive medications. But there's a lot of people still ending up in the hospital, most of whom are not fully vaccinated with their three-shot uh, vaccination series. Um, so what should you do if you have a kid uh, under five? Well, uh, I like Dr. Caitlin Gentilly's rationale. You can, you'll have the options of either Pfizer or Moderna. My personal preference, I agree with her rationale. If, it, if I had kids under that age, I'd probably be going with Moderna if I had the choice. I would get my kids vaccinated with either, but Moderna would be my first choice. And if you want to read her rationale, I'd highly encourage you to look at this link that I've posted uh, in the notes section. Uh, the other problem we have in Lincoln is, is our health disparities are still of a problem and, and vaccination rates in our black population especially are still much lower than everybody else. So we also need to keep, get the message out to the black population, to some extent the Hispanic population. The disparities in, in deaths and hospitalizations is partly due to lower vaccination rates, lack of, lack of trust in the healthcare market and, and sometimes lack of access. So this is something we'll be working on in the future is trying to figure out how do we get these people to get their third shot so we can ma make them as protective as as the white and Asian populations. Keep in mind, of course, that the vaccine is not 100% effect pr protective, but that's okay. Uh, getting a runny nose is not a big deal. It's being dead, hospitalized, or having long COVID you want to prevent. And the vaccines are highly protective, more than 90 to 95% protective against these. Not 100%, of course, but still more than 95% if you've got those three shots. So in the future, trusted and sources of information, where do I go? I Right now, I'm, I'm honestly kind of disappointed in the communication for, uh, from governmental public health sources. And so my two primary sources are these two people. So I go to a firm for general uh, public health and epidemiology. I like Caitlin Genley's post. They're very well researched. She has great visuals. Plus, she writes from the perspective of her mom, young mom, which I think is good for a lot of people to hear. Uh, she's got a master's in public health plus a PhD in epidemiology. So very well informed and probably one of the most followed uh, sources from a public health standpoint. From the clinical side as far as what were the best treatments right now I actually my preference is Dr. Daniel Griffin's update on TWIV he's an infectious disease specialist uh, and they do an event with him and Vincent Dracaniello really good discussions I think they come out every week uh, about 30 to 60 minutes usually on a Friday or Saturday they're kind of my mowing the lawn podcast so if you want to stay up to date in the future uh, please follow these and because uh, this uh, may be my last COVID update because I'm going to be working on other things in the future hopefully which I'll discuss in just a minute uh, so what other things I keep wanting you to focus on and just the difference between have to and should do. You don't have to wear a, uh, to wear a mask and vaccinations aren't required, but you should. So what do I do? I did get my fourth shot. Uh, my ma main rationale for that is because I'm busy and I like to travel a lot and it gives me some extra protection because I just don't want to miss work. I think three shots was, was enough to prevent me from hot, lower my hospital rates of hospitalization and death to what I would consider I not worrisome. I got the fourth shot just to decrease the chances I'd have to 
quarantine somewhere, and I'll plan on getting my fifth shot this fall. Uh, I'm over 50, but generally healthy. This is what I decided to do. And I'm still wearing a mask occasionally. For the most part, I've returned to living my life pre-COVID. I still go out to a restaurant. I don't worry about much at all, but there's a few times where I do wear a mask. The biggest one I'm, I'm going to probably continue for the future is masking for airport travel. Uh, so my wife and I did go to San Diego a couple weeks ago. She had a conference, and I got to be conference spouse, which was fun. Uh, but, you know, the place where most infections spread around the, around the world, whether it's COVID, influenza, or monkeypox, it's spreading a lot of times within an airport to, to people around. When you're walking through an airport, you're exposed to hundreds and hundreds of people from all over the world. This is the one... the highest risk time you could actually I think uh, for exposure to just about anything so in the future I'm probably going to wear a mask I like this KF94 because it fits my face the best uh, however I don't worry so much when I'm on the air airplane so when we hit cruising altitude when the ventilation system is at full capacity there's a lot of air changes so what I do is I usually open this wide open and then uh, for mo a lot of the air flight I often do take my mask off because I'm only exposed a little bit just to the people around me for the most part uh, but that's a slow number versus the hundreds you're going to run into in an airport so I think this is probably the highest risk uh, place in the world right now is walking through an airport but we know that masks work so that's what I would do occasionally the, some healthcare facilities will have you wearing masks to protect those around you and I think we might be doing some intermittent masking for local surgeries in the future maybe we won't but maybe we will so I think that is a possibility this fall uh, as far as what are we going to doing, folks, uh, in the future, so some of you may have uh, followed our HealthyNebraska.org. We do these public tableau visuals where we try to make uh, vi uh, data available and interactive to everybody. Uh, we're going to focus on other things here in the future, and the big thing we're going to focus on in the future is maternal child health. And so uh, Ted and I uh, were approved as researchers by the CDC, and so we have access to the full vital records data set for the Nebraska. And these are now public where we're putting visualizations of uh, maternal child health out outcomes at birth for both at both the health district level and the county level. So if you want to look at your your local health district or counties, you know C-section rates, rates of low birth weight infants, uh, preterm births, uh, NICU transfers, breastfeeding rates. We're going to have these all, and you can basically go there, click on each of them, and see what that is. Uh, this will be turning into a full fledged full fledged HealthyNebraska.org website in the future. But we'll have it so you can link and go straight to these visuals for those of you who like to look at data, because uh, we want to focus more on this in the future. Health. We should be putting. COVID to bed if we get enough people to get their three vaccines, I think for the most part, absent another major variant. Uh, so we want to focus on other sources of health for kids in the future. So hopefully this is helpful to you. Usually the disclaimer, these are my opinions, not necessarily those of the organizations I work with and for, but this is where I work so you can verify who I am and what I do. And hopefully these updates have been helpful to you during the series.